Welcome to the Hour of the Time, Linda Thompson. Well, hi, how are you? Well, I'm a lot better now that I've got you on the air, finally. <laughs> well, we've been awfully busy here, I'll tell you. It's been uh, pretty bad the past uh, several weeks in terms of just having time to even sleep. Linda, I need you to talk a little louder, maybe put your mouth a little closer to the uh, receiver. You know what I should have done? I should have set the mic up on the desk because this daggone phone isn't worth a hoot. Well, you're okay now. i got a good level on you. Okay. Tell us what happened to you not too long ago. Well, on May the 11th, you mean when I got uh, thrown into a wall? Yes. Oh, uh, by the, the thug out here? Well, I... The Nazi jackbooted thugs is the proper term. Right. Well, we had... Um, it started, really, in February. The I had a deposition scheduled. Actually, it started last July. The, the Clinton health care bus. I had a deposition scheduled in that case in February, and I went to the county prosecutor's office to take depositions, and the prosecutor himself showed up. He was trying to get publicity, basically, on my coattails, thinking he would make a, a scene and, and make a lot of media for himself, because he's not really very well known. And the cameras do have a tendency to follow you around, don't they? They really do, and I don't call them. That's what's bizarre to me, and it, it's as if, you know, if they want a story, they go find me. So in any event, um, he shows up in this deposition, and he starts asking me, do you have a gun? Well, first of all, it's none of his business. Second of all, it's illegal to have one. Third of all, I have a permit, believe it or not. And fourth... I believe it. I've seen it. It was weird that he would just pop up in the middle of nowhere and want to know if I had a gun or a permit. So I, I thought I would uh, yank him around a little bit because he obviously does not know the Constitution. He now, now, we're on radio now. You didn't mean physically yank him around. Oh, no, no. I okay. meant, uh, you know, play with him, just asking him questions. Got to remember, there's some smart people out there, but there's <laughs> also a lot of airheads and a lot of beginners and a lot of people that don't have any idea what we're talking about. Well, <clears throat> it's, it's the idea that any government official thinks they can come up to you and say, papers, please. You know, we have a Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment says you can't do that. And this guy is a, is a county prosecutor. So he says, do you have a gun? So I said, it's none of your business. And then he said, do you have a gun? I said, do you have a warrant? And he says, do you have a gun? And I said, do you have probable cause? And I was making the point that what he was doing was being, number one, rude and nosy. Number two, he was disobeying the Fourth Amendment. He was violating your rights protected by the Constitution. And he, he had, that is a limit on him because he's a government employee. Well, he didn't understand that. He did not like it at all. He, and I got this on the record. I have a transcript of this, and anybody that's on Internet, we can send you a copy right away. But this, I had a court reporter there, and he started saying if I didn't answer his questions, he was going to have me put in jail. And I said, for what? And he said, for trespassing. And I said, we're in a public building. This was the city-county building in downtown Indianapolis where all the courts are, where all the prosecutor's offices are. This is a big public building. So I got all of this on the record, and I put it out all over the city to embarrass him because of the way it finally ended up. Not only that, but let's sort of prep the listeners. You are an attorney. Right. You were there for deposition in the performance of your requirements as an attorney. Right. And as a, as a party to the action... And uh, you could in no way have been trespassing, even if you didn't, because it is a public building. That's right. And it's also perfectly legal to wear a gun. But it also happened that I wasn't even wearing a gun that day, which is very unusual. But I was not wearing one, and I had already had a conversation about that with someone else just a few minutes earlier that worked in his office. So I began to think this, this smelled and looked a lot like a setup. Welcome to the club. <laughs> And he eventually, the way it ended was, he said, oh, you're the de defendant in this case. Criminal defendants don't have any rights. He said, you leave this building. This deposition is over. You know, it's over, it's over. You're out of here. You're out of here. And he kicked me out. Well, that's illegal, too. But I said, in case you don't remember it from your Constitution 101 law class, defendants are innocent until proven guilty. And he said, no, I flunked that. <coughs> Now, I got that on the record, and it embarrassed him terribly because I put it out all over the city. <laughs> and I have put it out all over Internet, and I've made a point of calling him Scott I flunked Constitutional Law Newman, the prosecutor, every time I talk about him in court. Change his name to Scott I flunked the Constitution 
class Alfred E. Newman. <laughs> and and he he's the one that started the model, or he was one of the people involved in the model program between Kansas City and Indianapolis where they, the police are used to make traffic stops and then ask people if they have guns and take their guns. And they're now teaching it down in Jackson, Mississippi. Well, I have a lawsuit against him over this, and I have been suing him on all of his illegal programs of, of seizing guns from citizens and basically just ignoring the Constitution. And he thinks it's funny. He thinks it's funny to ignore the Constitution. He thinks that because he is the prosecutor, he can do what he wants. Well, so here we come to May, which is two months later. Um, I ha There's a uh, fellow that works for the Anti-Defamation League and is a snitch for the FBI named Richard Bottoms that lives here locally. And he follows patriots around, but he has made it his thing in life to follow me around. And I was getting real tired of it because everywhere I went there, he is. And the la he shows up in court for cases that I have, things like that. And he had pushed into me in court one day, and I said, well, good. Now I can go get a restraining order against him, and he'll have to stop coming everywhere I am. So this, I this guy, in fact, is, is a real pushy flake, isn't he? Yeah, he, he's a, actually, he's a... Sleaze ball. Well, he's gay, and he's real effeminate, and he just gets right up, and he's always there. And he always writes that the... Now, his whole point in life is to try. He's the guy that wrote about our computer network and claimed that it was racist and Nazi last March. <laughs> they say that about everybody who uh, loves this country. Well, that was the first article, yeah. but he was so um, he was ridiculed here all over the city because we've had a computer network since '85, and everyone knows us. And and he pops up out of nowhere and writes this really stupid article that nobody believed. He was just ridiculed because we have we've been known around here on computer circles for years, uh -huh. and certainly not as racist or Nazis. So anyway, there he is, and I'm going to go. I went to file charges against him, and I go to the prosecutor's office in Marion County to do that, and they have a a place where you get in line, take a number, file your charges. And I took my number and went in to file the charges, and this big fellow in civilian clothes comes out, and I go back in the office with him and start telling him I'd like to file charges for stalking and a battery against this Richard Bottoms because he had pushed me that day, and I wanted a restraining order against him. And he starts looking in, the, in his little computer, and he says, what happened to this gun charge you had last summer? I said, oh, it was bogus, and it was never prosecuted. I have a permit. And he says, do you have a gun? And so we start having the same conversation I had had with the prosecutor. He says, do you have a gun? And I said, it's none of your business. And he says, do you have a permit? And I began to think, this guy is, I can't believe he's asking. I said, you mean for the gun you haven't established that I have? And he says, do you have a gun? And I said, do you have a warrant? Do you have probable cause to ask me these questions? And I'm trying to make the point that what he's doing is illegal. You can't just simply walk up to citizens and demand to know what they have. If they're not breaking the law, you have to leave them alone. And he was not, as far as I could tell, he was not a policeman. He was in civilian clothes, sitting at his desk. He was an intake worker. And I thought he was especially pushy to be asking these questions to begin with. So I figure the interview's over. I stand up. I'm going to leave. And he jumps around his desk, slaps handcuffs on me, and says, you're going to jail. And I said, for what? And he says, for having a gun without a permit. I said, you don't have even established if I have a gun yet. And I said, and I do have a permit. He says, oh, you've got a gun. And he reaches under my jacket and he got my gun because I did have my gun. Pulls it out, and so he illegally searches me right there. And, he, and I said, well, my permit's in my purse. He says, well, you can't get to it and you're going to jail. And he starts to take me out of the office there because I can't get to my permit. It doesn't matter at this point. It's obvious that the whole arrest is bogus. Turns out this clown works directly for the prosecutor. And he had figured out who I was and was making brownie points for his boss. As we're going through the, the uh, lobby, and I'm handcuffed, I kept telling everybody we passed, I have a gun permit. It's in my purse. He won't let me show it. I'm being arrested. Call my husband. Here's his number. Because Al was just downstairs on, on a cell phone. And I, I was basically blowing his arrest by telling everybody that his basis for arrest was bogus and they could reach my husband downstairs at this number. As we rounded a corner in a hallway, he got fed up with me yelling this at everybody and, and 
waited until we got out of sight. He grabbed my arm, because I was walking with him, for, you know, not resisting or anything. It's r- ridiculous to resist arrest when you're already handcuffed. This guy is uh, six foot four and weighs 300 pounds, and he's a muscle builder. We, he, we get around this alcove, and he just grabbed my arm and threw me into a concrete wall face first. And I hit the wall, ended up having to get uh, six sta- stitches in my face, and it damaged the retina in my eye to where I've got a, a permanent loss of vision. And some things that are happening, I have to go to the doctor now fairly frequently for this eye. They're trying to restore the vision in the eye, and I'm getting, I get headaches all the time from this in my eye. But in any event, I had a, a huge bruise and a huge cut on my face. Well, we go down the basement starts to take me down to the basement and my husband happened to come in right then and saw my face bleeding all over the place well this guy i think was taking me down there to beat me and this is important later when we talk about joe love but uh he turns around when he saw my husband and took me somewhere else to where my husband couldn't find me and i was able because um everybody knows my name up there somebody reported that this happened and the news media got over there immediately and I think if they had not, I would not, wouldn't have had the same outcome as I did. And I think if my husband hadn't been there, then I would be dead. Because this is exactly the same scenario uh, as with Joe Love. Joe Love was a patriot. He showed up in court for the sixth hearing in two months on a Mickey Mouse case that he shouldn't even have been there for at all. And they killed him right in, in front of everybody. Well, let's let's back up a little bit. What was he there for? Well, he, basically, he was set up because they wanted him there. Pretty much, if they want to take you in, the safest place for them to kill you is where they are with their buddies. Yeah, we know all about buddies here in this town. Well, um, what was the charge for him? Well, that that's one of the funny things. To his charge was supposedly theft. But listen to the story behind it. And, and when I checked the record, he didn't have a theft charge. They were telling everybody he had a theft charge, and his public defender was acting like he had a theft charge. What was the charge, actually? Uh, obstruction of justice. And that's even stupider, because the man was a cab driver. He was trying to expose <coughs> prostitution and drug running ring involving some very high-level officials here in Indiana. And he had found the, their connections and so forth. Well, these cops had told him they were going to kill him. And he had told everybody that these cops had told him they were going to kill him. And he even had tape recordings of people threatening him, telling him they were going to kill him. One night he's out in his cab, and the police pull him over. He had picked up a guy he said was on parole that was some kind of big-time drug dealer in the back of his cab. Well, they didn't arrest this guy in the back of his cab. They said they did, but they didn't. And they arrest Joe, and they arrested him. The cop, it was one of the cops that had threatened him in the past, said he had a joint, one joint of marijuana. He said that Joe had thrown it on the ground and put it under his foot. And the cop said he picked up the piece of joint that was left and put it on the hood of the car and that Joe ate it off the hood of the car. <laughs> now, if, if he was going to eat it off the hood of the car, he had plenty of time to eat oh, it. Oh, it doesn't fly anyway. This guy's trying to expose a drug ring, yeah. and they're trying to say they arrested him because he had one little... Uh... Right. Well, this is the guy that wrote a, a, uh, the song called... What do you Up- call those? Roach or something? Huh? What do you call it? A roach? Well, yeah, they were saying it was a, he had stepped on it on the ground, and they picked up the remains of it. He wrote a song called Stop the Madness that was used by Nancy Reagan in the Just Say No campaign. Around here, he was fairly well known as a musician. Um, He's a very talented man. He used to be an honor guard in the uh, Indy 500 Boy Scouts, and he was an honor carrier for the Star as a kid. This was not some sleazebag, fly-by-night junkie, okay? This guy had no criminal record. He's very well respected around here. He's a patriot. (coughs) So, anyway, they're saying that that he ate this joint off the hood of the car, so they charged him with, get this, theft of government property for eating the joint. (laughs) So they've admitted the joint was the government's joint, see, if it existed at all. Well, so he gets to court. Yeah, if if it was his, it couldn't have been government property. Right. 
So he, he, he gets to court, and the, the judge actually, on the record, finds that there's no probable cause for the theft charge. But they never dismissed the theft charge. And they left an obstruction of justice charge on against him, too. And then they get him a public defender. Now, this is a, a case that a first-year law student could have gotten thrown out. It is that bad. They also, in the probable cause affidavit by the cop, he said the reason that he pulled Joe over was he saw a cab driving without its headlights in the parking lot of a hotel. Now, that certainly sounds suspicious, doesn't it? <laughs> a good reason to pull somebody over. Well, he said he was watching cab number 322. Joe's cab was 336. Right there, that whole case should have been thrown out. It was garbage from the beginning to end, and any first-year law student could have gotten this case thrown out. But his public defender didn't do it. He treated it as, this was the most bizarre twist of things I've seen yet, his public defender comes in and pleads Joe incompetent to stand trial and says he wants to send him to psychiatrist because he's delusional, because he's talking about Nancy Reagan and Birdseed. Well, when he was talking about Nancy Reagan, he was talking about the song he had written that Nancy Reagan used in the Just Say No campaign. One of the things he was using to explain to his attorney that he, didn't, he was not involved in drugs. He was trying to expose the drug runners. And the bird seed was a confrontation he had had earlier with some of the same state police when one of the policemen that had threatened him had raided his home trying to find drugs or plant drugs, and he had bought sterilized marijuana seeds as bird seed so that there would be something in his house for this guy to get if he really showed up. And it's not illegal to have sterilized marijuana seeds. He had bought two 50-pound bags of them, to leave kind of as a present for him, you know, as a joke. And these 50 pounds, they're, they're perfectly legal to own. They're sterilized. Yeah, but in this day and age, it's not smart to joke around like that. Well, he, in fact, I would say it is incredibly stupid. Well, he did it so they wouldn't take other stuff in his house, and actually it worked. They're killing people for nothing, and he's playing this kind of a stupid joke? Well, they took these 50-pound bags, and instead of, uh, you know, the other things he had in his house because they thought they really had something. <laughs> but it also did make them mad when they found out they didn't have anything. But this was the bird seed he had been talking about, that it had made the cops look bad when they had done that. They had come into somebody's house without a warrant, searched it, and found all this bird seed, and they looked pretty stupid. So that was another reason they were mad at him. But in any event, his public defender pleads him incompetent. Now, you don't plead somebody incompetent in a case unless it's a last ditch. You have nothing else you can do. Because if the court finds that the person is incompetent to stand trial, they can send them to a mental institution indefinitely. And well, th that's not true. They can only hold you for so many days, and then they have to have a court hearing to, f to decide whether they can hold you another so many days. All it takes for them to hold you so many days, which is 90 days at a shot, is for a psychiatrist to come in and say, you need to be held. And they do. And you can be held for, practically forever if you're crazy or if you're found incompetent. <clears throat> now, you can be mentally ill and not be incompetent because incompetent just means that you know the difference between right and wrong and you can assist in your own defense at trial. Mentally ill people oftentimes know right from wrong and they can assist in their own defense. That does not make them incompetent. But Joe wasn't mentally ill, and he wasn't incompetent. His public defender didn't do a thing for him except have him come to court six times in two months to do nothing. This was another thing that was bizarre about this, was that the public defender treated this case so, so strangely. This should have been a case that went away. This shouldn't be a case that you try to get the man examined by mental health professionals. And then he goes and he gets two police psychiatrists to do the exam. Well, of course, these psychiatrists come in and say the man's crazy as a March Hare. And that's what they testify to. But he had a family doctor. This guy didn't check with his family doctor. This was not even a pretense of any kind of, of a hearing. Yeah, but, Linda, we've only got an hour. Let's not get hung up in these technicalities. Let's okay. get to the point. Well, he... Joe's standing there in court. He's got a $2,000 bond on this case, and really all he's got to do is forfeit his $2,000 bond and leave. 
you know, the state should be happy. And he says that to the judge. He says, this is ridiculous, and I want to go. Okay, hold on. We've got to take a break. Be right back, folks. Don't go away. Hey. Clinton is marching us towards the millennium. His agenda, a new world order. He intends to foreclose upon the people and the property of the United States of America. Well, i got to tell you, folks, when socialists hear this broadcast, they just melt in their shoes like the Wicked Witch of the West when Dorothy poured the water over her head. <laughs> Nothing left but a pool of green slime. And, of course, you wouldn't be listening to this broadcast without Swiss America Trading, the people who specialize in real money, precious metals in all of their various forms. Now, if you really understand what's happening in this country, they keep telling us that the economy is getting better, that we've never had it so good. Everybody's working at the same... Save the children. Comrade Clinton chides us and guides us into surrendering our sovereignty piece by piece to a one world government. That's right, folks. Yes, the ATF, the FBI, Janet Reno, and Bill Clinton said <laughs> they destroyed all those people in Waco, Texas, to save the children. Right, Linda? They lied to us. All the time. Why do we expect them to do any different? You know something you said in your book. you got to get your level up again. Okay, well, one thing that you said in your book was that they would be using mental illness to round up people in this country, and that's exactly what they're doing right now to patriots. They have classified being a patriot as a form of mental illness. It's a new disease called fear of your government. Yeah, that's what I said in my book. Patriotism would be called a mental illness. And it's, it's absolutely happening. We had another patriot thrown in jail here about two weeks ago, supposedly, for for being crazy, and all he did was put up a notice of a patriot meeting at work. On a bulletin board. And we, we ended up having to do quite a bit to get him out of the nut house. But back to Joe Love, he was in court, and they were trying to send him away for good to shut him up. That was the sole reason that all of this went the way that it did. He was not crazy. Uh, he was not certainly not delusional. Everything he talked about was correct. Yeah. What they wanted to put him away for is he had discovered and had the goods on this male prostitution and drug ring. That's right. Okay. He was trying to blow the whistle on it, and it involved some very high-level officials here in Indiana. One's the mayor, isn't it? Uh, one's mayor, one's uh, a senator that um, may be running for president. And there's quite a lot of people involved in this thing by the time he got through shaking the tree. So he's in court, and he says he's going. he wants to leave. Now, he didn't try to leave. He just said he wants to leave. And on the record, no one ordered him to be taken into custody. All the witnesses in court said this man did nothing. Five cops jumped on him, grabbed his arms, took him to the ground, and began beating him. Now, wait a minute. Back up. You, this is something that the judge said that you told me is on the record, uh, and I want to hear that. Uh, Joe said to him, we know why I'm here. If you're going to kill me, just go on and kill me now. I'm ready to die right here. I wish you'd just kill me right here in the courtroom. And the judge says, okay. Twenty minutes later, this man was dead. And they jumped him in the courtroom, and that judge did not even raise up off his butt to look over the bench as they were beating him. Witnesses in the courtroom said the judge never said a word, never even looked over to see what they were doing to this man. Six cops were waiting. All during the hearing, there was a cop that came out and stood at, at Joe's elbow. His name was Lee Marble. He had a can of mace, that he stood there with this can of mace at his elbow just stood there waiting to use it, and he jumped him and sprayed him in the face with the mace. The other cops jumped him. His, own, his attorney said 
that a cop named Greer kicked him on the floor. Witnesses have told me who was doing kicking and hitting. You can hear on the tape recording of this whole event, this man did nothing. He's going, my head, my head, as they hit him in the head with these batons. And he says, you're going to take me to the basement and kill me, aren't you? So he knew what they do over there. And that's exactly what they did. They took him out of the courtroom. They supposedly were taking him to a padded cell in the jail. But you don't, he wasn't crazy. He didn't go berserk. He didn't do anything. And he wasn't ordered arrested. There was no reason for them to even have their hands on him. And now, of course, they're telling the story that he went berserk in the courtroom. We've got evidence that proves that's a lie. So, but well, Weren't there a lot of witnesses? There were a lot of witnesses, and I've interviewed over 30 witnesses. Not one single witness said this man was resisting or kicking or fighting or anything. He was saying, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, And when he was still talking. Then they get him in an arm chokehold, and it ruptured the arteries in his neck, which is fatal, in this arm chokehold. Once they did that to him, he was dying. Could not possibly resist. He was unable to resist because he was dying. They threw him in this filthy cell. I've well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before they threw him in the cell, they stripped him naked. They stripped his clothes off, and they beat him the whole time they were doing it. Threw him in the floor of this, this cell is five foot by five foot. It's got human excrement and blood on the floor, and all it's got is a little hole in the corner for a toilet. And I've got pictures of this place if you think I'm exaggerating. They threw him in that floor, and five of them jumped on him, on his arms, his legs, his chest, his stomach. Another man jumped on him with a radio cord. They've got those little portable radios that has a walkie-talkie on the shoulder, a cord that runs down to their belt. Well, they used that cord and helped choke him some more. Now, this is after the man's already dying, and they're, they kicked him so brutally that his armpits were purple. His legs inside of his thighs and, and his groin are dinner plate size purple bruises his back is black and blue purple and this man was dead so long that the imprints on the floor were in his back which you only get if, if, if you've been dead at least 30 minutes before they call anybody to take your body away but linda comrade clinton said on national television how dare you claim we live in tyranny in the freest nation in the world how can this be? Joe Love was the fifth person to leave that cell in an ambulance that week. He left dead. Now, folks, lest you think this is an isolated incident, they're killing patriots all over the country. Just this last week, they killed a militia chaplain, stopped him on the highway, it said on the license plate of his car, Militia Chaplain. Chaplains traditionally never carry weapons. He got out of his car, took three steps, didn't move his arms, didn't have a weapon, didn't do anything threatening. This whole incident was witnessed by three people. The police shot him four times in the chest and murdered him in cold blood right there on the highway. Oh, Bill, I need to fix something so you don't uh, get, get this back at you, but he did have a weapon. But he had it on, in a holster on his hip, and all of the witnesses could plainly see it because they had just come back from a common law court meeting. Wait a minute. I have their, te I have their statements. They don't say anything about a weapon in those statements. Well, he, the, we've got their statements, and they have. They, he did have a weapon, and it was on his left hip in a holster. Okay. I stand corrected in but that case. he didn't case. touch it, and there was no question that he didn't touch it. Well, the three witnesses say that he took three steps slowly toward the officers to find out what they stopped him for, and... Uh, uh, didn't move his arms in any... They stopped him twice, because they stopped him for a traffic stop, let him go. He's driving along. They stopped him again, and he gets out, and he had already walked toward him once, you know, and done nothing. And they just shot him in cold blood. They're having a grand yeah. jury on that next week in Ohio. Shot him four times in the chest. The officers claimed that he drew a gun and, and was uh, going to shoot them, and all the witnesses say that that is a barefaced, blatant lie. Right. Now, and this is the common denominator. Now, if they identify you as a gun owner or a patriot, they will simply use either one to excuse killing you. They'll say, oh, he was a patriot, he was crazy, or he pulled a gun, I had to kill him. And even if you don't...
don't have a gun, they will put a gun on you. Oh, yes. Most police officers carry what they call a throwaway. In, in, my... case, in case they make a mistake or they purposely murder someone, they pull out the throwaway, which is untraceable, and they plant it in the victim's hand. This is uh, well known. Any police officer uh, who is honest with you will tell you this. And I've known many police officers in my life, and it's it's absolutely true. Well, in my case, there was no question when that, that uh, man arrested me. And by the way, his name is Jeffrey Dunn, D-U-N-N, and he's a personal thug for the prosecutor here in Marion County. It turns out this man was a, a special deputy working directly for the prosecutor who I had just embarrassed. He was in civilian clothes. There was no question that what he did to me was retaliatory and purely set up. I didn't do anything. He had no probable cause for any re no reason whatsoever to do anything to me. And what did he tell the public? What did he put in his report to try to justify what he did after the fact? He said I was delusional and he was concerned for his safety and the safety of the people in the city. <laughs> I, I was there giving a report for crying out loud. Here you are, a woman, handcuffed. Right. Well, at that point, I'm handcuffed, and then he said I battered him. But you know why I shouldn't have said, here you are, a woman handcuffed, because you're not the typical woman at all. Yeah, but the thing is, this guy's 6'4", 300 pounds, and he says I battered him, and then if you read the report, he can't keep it straight which leg he thinks he got hurt. <clears throat> and he also admits he wasn't. He did, I didn't touch the man, so everything he made up was bogus anyway. But this is what they did for me, and then for Joe, they killed Joe. Joe Love was killed right there with witnesses everywhere. Upstairs, downstairs, every place they beat this man and killed him, there were witnesses. And those witnesses have all been brave enough to come forward and tell the truth. Now, I made a uh, pamphlet of information on Joe Love because people have got to see this. His family wants this information out to everybody. <coughs> so we made a pamphlet that's got pictures of Joe Love as, as he used to be before they beat him up and brutally murdered him and then on the back we took pictures of joe love's body after he was dead and he, there's been two autopsies the autopsy from uh the chief medical examiner of kentucky said that there's no question the man was choked to death in an arm chokehold by police and beaten from head to toe the marion county coroner here initially tried to cover it up and they said he had a heart attack well he didn't have any evidence of a heart attack and they finally changed their story and said that he was he suffocated. They won't <coughs> count. Uh, but in any event, it doesn't matter. You can see the big purple marks on his neck. You can see the bruises up and down his... I mean, these aren't little bruises. We're talking huge purple welts. And this, this coroner from Marion County said he didn't see any evidence of bruising. But, Linda, the police are just doing their job. That's the other thing they said. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> they said... I, I mean, I didn't really know it, but I instinctively knew that that's what they would say. That's well, what now, they always say. They're, they're saying, well, what are you supposed to do when somebody big goes berserk? We have to restrain him. Well, first of all, he didn't go berserk. He didn't do anything. They went berserk, and they killed him, and now they're trying to blame him. You know, he blamed the victim and somehow that it's all his fault. Well, they set him up to bring him in there to kill him that day, and they did. Let me tell you something, folks. The police have been doing this for so many years. A lot of those years, under a population that said the police could do no wrong and never would believe these allegations of police brutality. Now it's happening so often that even the stupidest of the sheeple out there are understanding that something is terribly wrong. These literally really are Nazi jackbooted thugs. Well, we found out from the Associated Press that they would not let this story on national news wire services, <coughs> even though there's been plenty of media calling about this story. They will not let it on in, in that it's being killed by some politician. Now, I suspect it's Luger myself, but it could be somebody else. Well, the truth is it's being killed by the socialist editors who want the police state under socialist government. Well, we're supposed to have a grand jury into this next week, but I'll tell you how bogus this grand jury is. The man who charged Joe Love and had him in court that day is who's going to be conducting the grand jury. Oh, boy. Yes, and he will get to decide what evidence the grand jury sees. Now, if I'd have known that, I would have had some circus music queued up here, but I, uh, I missed it. Well, he also is a, <coughs> used to be in the same law firm as the mayor. He used to work directly for the mayor, 
and he got into office as prosecutor because he's got his head so far up the mayor's behind his eyes. <laughs> okay, so that's the connections here. Now, the mayor is being investigated here for ghost employment and for giving jobs to people that contributed $20,000 to his campaign, things like that. Well, guess who's going to investigate the mayor? The same guy. So there's no collusion, there's no incest here, is there? And that's the man that's going to be conducting this grand jury. His name is Scott Newman. We're demanding an independent prosecutor in an independent county with a special grand jury for this. And we've had a lot of pressure we've been able to put on the city and county officials. There's been a lot of local media coverage here about this because we're simply not going to let them get by with this. We're going to make these murderers pay for what they did to this man. We've got plenty of proof. We can prove they murdered him. At this point, we even know who did it. And they have not once asked for any of our proof. They want to know who our witnesses are because they've already gone around and intimidated witnesses. Two guys that are in the jail. One guy got offered a deal if he would lie, and another guy took a deal. And witness, we had a witness, Gary Spaulding. You remember the guy that went down to Waco and took baby food? Yeah. Well, he was here for a press conference we had one day and was attacked by a cop that had eavesdropped on the press conference and followed myself and the brother, Jeff Love, down the sidewalk. We turned around, and he took off like a scalded dog. Well, Gary Spaulding followed him just to get a picture, and the man attacked him and tried to choke him and left huge marks on his neck and cut. They won't take charges against cops here for any reason. You cannot file a charge against cops. Well, they're trying to cover up this, this stuff here, too. You know, they tried that's, to set us up here. That's because of the prosecutor. He refuses to t take charges. If I could give out some numbers, I want people to call these people and put pressure on them and tell them we need an independent prosecutor into the death of Joe Love. Now, it doesn't cost very much. You, you know, 25 cents, make a phone call, tell them you're watching, you want to know what happens with this grand jury, and you're not going to rest until you find out what the truth is in this case. And the truth is the man was killed, and he was killed by several officers. We know six of them for sure. We know who choked him. We know who used the radio cord on him. We know who kicked him. We know who beat him. Now, there's six more people that let that happen. But in any event, the people to call are the Indiana Supreme Court, 317-232-2550. That's 317-232-2550. The Indiana Attorney General, 317-232-6201. And the mayor of Indianapolis, Steve Goldsmith, 317-327-3601. Now, we've got several newspapers and TVs here in town. The best TV station to call to talk to would be WRTV Channel 6, 317-635-9788. Tell them to keep up the coverage. But we did get a booklet made all about Joe. If you, if you can get this out to your local media, we would be happy to send you one of these booklets. The family paid for these out of their own pockets. They cost a dollar apiece to print. So please reach in your pocket, send a buck and enough for postage along with it. A dollar fifty would be nice to the family to make for the cost of these things if you're going to ask for one. Get them out, though, to your local churches and to your local media so we can keep the pressure on. This is a case where we can expose a bunch of these jack-booted thugs that have murdered a man in cold blood. They have no way to get out of it. Nazi jack-booted thugs. That's exactly what they are, <laughs> and they know it. And they are still at work. They didn't even suspend them pending an investigation. Yeah. Now, these are the same people, even the same names that have been involved in other beatings in the jail in the past. Same people were interested in Joe Love that were interested in me, that were interested in other patriots, these are the thugs. Well, you're right about the way uh, police cover for each other. Here, the people that set us up, one is an ex-cop, the other one is an active duty cop. And uh, I said the, the other night that uh, I didn't think that the police department was involved. But we went down to get the police report today, and it's obvious that the police department is involved because they're covering this up. There is no police report. The two people who uh, set us up are telling people around town that uh, it was a mistaken identity and that somebody was arrested. Uh, there has been no arrest. That's a barefaced lie. 
in order to uh, try to get us uh, off their trail because uh, we, we know who it is and they won't pass a lie detector test. And we're not going to let this go. Uh, and, and I suggest the rest of you, when this, these things happen, pursue the criminals until you get them behind bars and use every legal method that you possibly can. It's absolutely I'm imperative. I'm up, up one side and down the other out here. Every, that's another thing. We're teaching a class to patriots this weekend on citizen's arrest and how to do lawsuits because we need to have these people, even if you can't keep the lawsuit going, if you can sue them, it's going to cost them money to get an attorney, and they've got some bean counter at the city that's going to start worrying when they have a lot of lawsuits against the city and the county because they're looking at that as a potential liability, expenses to them. Mm -hmm. They don't care that these people murder people, but they do care about their money. Yeah. I need to give out our address so people can get this uh, the booklet on Joe Love if they want it, Bill. Do, do that. Re uh, say it twice, in fact. American Justice Federation. 3850 South Emerson, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46203. It's American Justice Federation, which you can abbreviate AJF, 3850 South Emerson Avenue, Indianapolis, 46203. Now, just be sure you put on your envelope that this is for the Joe Love booklet, because all of the money, every penny that comes in that says Joe Love Booklet goes right back into printing. It's not, not one penny's going to anybody else. It's not going to lawyer fees. It's not going to investigation fees. It's not going to the family. It's going right back into printing more of these booklets to get them out all over. We want people to see what it looks like when a person is brutally murdered, beaten from head to toe by the police. Nazi jackbooted thugs. These, on the front cover is pictures of Joe as he looked normally. On the back, we have pictures of, of where they beat this man. From head to toe, he's dead in these pictures, and they are gory. I am sorry, but that's, we, we, you've got to see the truth. The truth is, this is real ugly. This is real nasty, and this is the truth. And this is what they're doing to people, and they cover it up. We're not letting it be covered up. And we want to do this whenever it happens to anybody. We're going to make it in the billboards if we can. We want America to see what these jackbooted Nazi Gestapo thugs do to people. Now you're talking my language. <laughs> well, you're right on, and that's exactly what everybody has to do. Bear in mind, folks, that we expect the next step around here is, is uh, and, and I'm going to let you know tonight so that it'll keep them from doing it. We expect them to try, uh, as the next step, to plant something illegal on, on or in one of our automobiles or on or in one of our properties. And uh, so if you ever hear that that has happened, that they have found any illegal weapons or any dope or anything like that in, in Linda's property or in her car or on my property or Bart's property or Mike's property or anybody's property, uh, it's a lie, and and if you don't no believe one that, in my family well, you don't have to defend yourself like that. I just make the statement: anybody who wants to inspect my home or my automobiles or my place of business anytime they want is welcome to do it. There is absolutely nothing illegal on any of these premises. That's right, and this is the thing. And we've said that if they come here like gentlemen with a search warrant, they're willing. To, you know, I'm willing to treat them like gentlemen. But if they come here like jackbooted thug Gestapo criminals, then that's how they're going to be treated. Ditto. Well, Linda, I want to thank you for being our very special guest tonight. You know, you were supposed to come to the conference, and uh, this whole story was supposed to come out, at least the story about what happened to you, um, as, a guest, as a guest, uh, yeah, I know, as a guest on the air during that conference, and uh, you didn't have the money to get here, and we didn't have the money to send you. And uh, as always, we're all just on the verge of bankruptcy every moment. I wish everybody that had written or called had just sent $2. We could still be on the radio, and I could be doing a lot more because we spend, I literally spend every penny I get in here doing exactly nothing but trying to expose what's going on. That's all I've done for the last three years. Yes, and I can uh, vouch for that. Also, if it wasn't for you, Linda Thompson, I can say this with no hesitation whatsoever, there would be no interest in Waco, Texas. There would be no investigation coming up, regardless of what the outcome is. There would be no anger or outcry in this nation about what happened when they murdered those people in that church in Waco, Texas. So I want to thank you. 
And uh, I know a lot of people have turned against you. You have become a target because you scared the living hell out of them when you called for the militia to march on Washington, D.C., and they will bury you if they can. But if they do, it will be over my dead body. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Good night. Good night. And uh, for all of you out there, get your head out of your butts and wake up. Smell the coffee. Good night, and God bless you all.